My book on Gone with the Glory is about the Civil War and the movie Civil War and Cinema, and it includes a chapter that has uh, some of this description of glory in it that you'll hear some more about tonight. I don't profess myself to be an expert on the 54th Massachusetts. Uh, students always ask me, Dr. Wills, are you an expert in the Civil War? And I say, no, I happen to know a few things about it, and every day I'm learning more. And if you're not doing the same thing, well then, shame on you, because that's part of life, is you, you learn things, you expand your, your, your interest, and uh, I've written quite a number of books, but every time I've written a book, I've learned something new, and I've oftentimes learned something about some things that I didn't have a clue about before. My last book is about, in glorious passages, the uh, non-combat deaths of the Civil War. There's not another book like it out there, and it does include stories of this region, including some of the final stories at Appomattox. But uh, it's an unusual book because it deals with all the ways in which combat could take someone out who happened to be a civilian or a friendly fire, but then so many of them are non-combat deaths, uh, just accidents. And sometimes it was disease. Disease took a terrible toll on Civil War soldiers. And, uh, and if you happen to be uh, in the family circle that lost someone, it didn't matter why they lost. If they fell off a steamboat or died in a... An explosion, a uh, steamboat explosion, I do uh, civilians, so civilian industries, uh, industrial accidents and all kinds of things, horse accidents. Uh, if you can think of it, uh, bayonet practice that goes wrong. When somebody decides they want to get too carried away, they forget that when you get carried away like that, you might get carried away. You saw that coming, didn't you? You knew that already, so they might get carried away. Okay, I'm not going to spend all night talking about myself and those things, but if you want to learn more about it, just stop and ask. Here's the movie poster. You'll notice who is in the foreground. In many ways, this is the story of Robert Gould Shaw. Now, it is also the story about the men he led that included the figures that will be represented by the incredible actors, Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman. And I'm just going to go ahead and admit something up front. I have a tremendous bias. I am a huge Morgan Freeman fan. So I'm just going to go ahead and let you know that. And I do like him even better. I know Denzel's good looking. I do that. He's a handsome fellow. But I'm really more of a Morgan Freeman fan than I am of a Denzel Washington fan. But that's all right. We'll get on to that a little bit later. But Matthew Broderick plays a Robert Gould Shaw and I think does an incredible job. And of course you see some of the historic images that you will see throughout. Now let me say also, nothing is credited here. Uh, I steal widely, uh, but I also um, go to the sites that are pretty prolific in giving us those images, the Library of Congress, various museums, including uh, the American Civil War Museum and so forth. And I do this for educational purposes, so just understand that I'm not going to turn around and sell this to anybody to make any money for myself. All right. Classic books and essays equals classic films, and I put a question mark because sometimes that seems to be the case and sometimes it doesn't. You will notice that any number of the films that are purported to be historical works on the American Civil War are actually just uh, some visualization, for lack of better terms, on an image uh, in the minds of the producers, the directors, and so forth and so on, of a famous book, novel, short story, series of articles, and so forth. And some of these are the more famous, Gone with the Wind, and Killer Angels uh, that uh, Gettysburg came out of, Red Badge of Courage. You can see Red Badge of Courage in a multiple level, set of levels, including a bona fide World War II hero, Audie Murphy, and then a man who happened to be in television at the time, pretty popular, a guy by the name of Richard Thomas, who played the character in a uh, remake of, of um, Red Badge of Courage. Richard Thomas was fresh out of, I don't know that he finished, but he may have finished by that time, uh, The Waltons. So if you remember The Waltons, John Boy was in the uh, remake of Red Badge of Courage. Well, uh, this movie, Glory, does come from a book, but it doesn't come from a novel. It comes from a real historical work. A one-gallant rush. Now there are some other things that uh, that the writers said that they consulted, but that seems to have been the volume that was the most inspirational for uh, what will subsequently appear on the screen. Now, as all things, you can't put everything that's in the book or everything that happened on the screen, so you have to make choices. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, tonight in terms of some of the choices that people are making and particularly Edward Zwick, who's going to make a number of choices, including leaving some things out. 
Compression is part of the way it goes. I mean, you have to take a story and try to fit it into a time frame that will allow for people to come into a theater and exit it in a timely fashion. If you want to make it historical and you really want to make it accurate, you're going to have to, however length, the length of time it is, you're going to have to have that much time in the theater. I don't think people would sit that long. I'm not sure that uh, any generation, but especially young generation, would do that today. Well, maybe they would, who knows? One can never underestimate what people will do. But, uh, so what they'll do is they'll pick and choose sort of key points or highlight points, and, uh, and they'll sometimes compress time frames, and that's understandable. Now, in many people's eyes, glory is going to open up a, an awareness of race and war that, uh, that they will say is unusual in Hollywood or unusual in films. Uh, that is certainly true. The focus on the 54th is very different than the focus had been on anything like it before. Uh, but it's not the first time that race, conflict, war, all of these things can be brought to the big screen. And uh, one of the uh, movies that does that to a certain extent is Band of Angels that stars Clark Gable and has also a young Sidney Poitier. So Sidney Poitier had been rescued from Africa by this slave trader who's now settled in, in uh, Louisiana and owns a plantation and ends up buying Yvonne Di Carlo, uh, who is of a, a mixed origin. And he ends up, of course, falling in love with her, which complicates the story. So. Many of these things are more complex, perhaps, than we think of, because Band of Angels is not a new film. This is a film that's been around for a while. We do know that at least one other film that starred this fellow, Clark Gable, also dealt with race, but again, in a very, very different way, and that was the movie Gone with the Wind. There's Big Sam. Big Sam is getting ready to do something that is very, very historically accurate in the sense of uh, African Americans who were enslaved, being required, being compelled to dig trenches for the, uh, or fortifications for the armies. In this case, if you remember that scene, he confronts Scarlet or sees Scarlet in the streets, and she says, what are you doing? And he says, we're going to go big dig ditches to keep Sherman out of Atlanta. An impressment, an impressment of slaves is certainly a part of the real story of the Civil War. When I do a, 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 a talk on the Civil War in the movies and do that emphasis, I actually have a copy that I didn't put here because it's not totally relevant to what we're doing tonight uh, of a, an impressment uh, form that was actually used. And of course, the money does not go to Big Sam. The money goes to the master. Okay, one of the historical elements that uh, is going to make this story possible is the Emancipation Proclamation. I put a map that I've used in class quite, an awful, quite a lot and of course a cartoon that makes it suggest as if uh, Abraham Lincoln is sort of throwing his last card onto the table uh, by putting out first the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and of course the Emancipation Proclamation itself. But it opens up the door, and you've seen this picture a minute ago, uh, for not only service in non-combat roles and the kind of traditional ways that you might expect uh, that would be available to African Americans, but, but actual combat service, the opportunity to, to bear arms. <coughs> and so the Emancipation Proclamation is going to open up the door to uh, the kind of story that you'll see in, depicted in the movie Glory. Now, Glory is not uh, unique in the sense that, uh, the story of Glory, let me say it, that was not unique in the sense that this is the only place that African American troops had participated in, in conflict. Uh, there's at least two prior situations that are fairly well known, we'll see an image of that in just a second, in which uh, African American service is already not only very prominent, but well known, is, is highly regarded. One of those is at Millican's Bend in June uh, 1863, uh, supported by the uh, river gunboats, the ironclads on the river there. The uh, service is going to be highly regarded, there's a comment the bravery of the troops involved here, especially the black troops, uh, completely revolutionized the sentiment in this army with regard to the employment of Negro troops. Uh, those of you who are going to get a chance to hear the talk about Virginians who wore the blue will hear about George Thomas, among others. I don't think I'm giving anything away to say that. Uh, but uh, when you get a chance to hear about that, you will hear about a person born in Southampton County who's born in a slave area who yet nevertheless goes with the Union ends up being a fairly complex individual in a lot of ways, although he's fairly straightforward, a soldier of, of duty, if you will, as he saw and understood duty, including, by the way, adhering to your oath, 
Yes. He took an oath to the Constitution. George Thomas thought that that ought to mean something. Now, we won't comment about those who chose another path. They had reasons for choosing what they chose. But for Thomas, that was a, a choice that was clear to him. The reason I bring up Thomas is that Thomas is later on at Nashville supposed to have been revolutionized in his understanding of the capability of black troops because he witnessed a, an attack against the Confederate flank that, uh, in which the, the troops that he supervised and sent forward took heavy casualties in uh, the, one of the last battles of the war at Nashville. And uh, he is supposed to have come away from that saying they will fight. These men will fight. I will tell you that I think that's a little bit uh, much to try to say that George Thomas arrived at that conclusion at that point. I think it confirmed that conclusion, but it was a conclusion he had already reached. For Thomas, it didn't matter who you were, black or white or anybody else, until you could prove yourself as a soldier, you weren't a soldier. And it didn't matter who you were. And it, so it took him a little bit of time to not only accept the uh, potential for white soldiers that he led as early as Kentucky in 1862, but for black soldiers in 1863 and 64. So just understand that this is a process by which individuals are looking at and seeing in real time, in real combat situations, the uh, proof as they feel is enough to make them understand uh, the position that they can now take going forward about the, the viability of having the African American soldiery in Union uniforms in the, in the federal service. So again, Millikan's Ben did that for this particular individual and for others who happened to be witnessing or experiencing that at that time. Uh, Port Hudson's another place where African American troops did a substantial service. Uh, they were known as the Louisiana Native Guards at this time, so the, the little different terminology, you know, we're familiar with United States Colored Troops, United States Colored Cavalry, United States Colored Heavy Artillery, United States Colored Light Artillery, but these troops were known as Louisiana Native Guards. Uh, they were sent against a very formidable uh, position that, that uh, the Confederates held uh, on the Mississippi, but below uh, Vicksburg. You'll notice Vicksburg here, Port Hudson, of course, further down. And, uh, and Port Hudson's actually going to surrender after Vicksburg, which is, again, something that no, not everybody understands. It is one of the most, uh, my friend Larry Hewitt says, the most photographed battlefield in the Civil War. Uh, and uh, part of the reason is because, of course, it's a fixed location that the Federals take and then the photographers have a a ample access to. So again, the role of the generals, you know, you can study General Banks, you can study General Gardner, you can study the, the fighting, but what you'll get is the African-American contribution recognized and seen uh, in bloody assaults and in, in uh, the most difficult combat assignments that any soldier could be asked to take, to undertake, and it was undertaken with, uh, with uh, full vigor and with, uh, with full awareness of the sacrifice that they would be asked potentially to make. Uh, here's Robert Goldshaw. I'm going to give you a quiz now. Which one is he? <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I don't know. I always think that Matthew Broderick really was uh, almost like a twin brother of Robert Goldshaw. This is Robert Goldshaw. That's Matthew Broderick. I actually use this in my book uh, because I just thought it was such a powerful image to say of, of how the, the two men looked. Uh, and I think the cameraman was the, uh, the person that put the print together understood we'd have a look at each other, which is kind of interesting. Of course, that is Robert Gould Shaw as well. Now, one of the things about the movie, and again, I'm just going to touch on some things. There will be a lot of things that I won't necessarily have time to go in in depth. And uh, we can certainly try to answer if you have questions, and I'll do the best that I can if I know an answer. Is to say that Gould, Robert Gouldshaw took on the assignment of the 54th with only slight reluctance. In other words, there's that momentary scene where they're all in the parlor, and the, uh, the governor's there, and everybody else of fame is there, and you'll see another figure there in a minute that you'll see and recognize. And um, supposedly, that's where he gets the offer to be colonel, and, uh, and he decides he's going to go outside to think about it, and his friend Cabot Ford comes out to, to talk to him, and between the two of them, they sort of mull over whether this is a good idea or not, and by the time they finish that scene, uh, Robert Gould Shaw, at least the Matthew Broderick Robert Gould Shaw, has decided I'm going to do it. 
That's not what really happened. In real life, he took a lot longer to make that decision and was actually very negative about it. And uh, in fact, turned it down and then was sort of pressured. His mother, especially, it would be a, a very powerful figure behind sort of getting, keeping the pressure on him. She was a really strong abolitionist and really pushes hard when the father really doesn't push as hard and uh, does, doesn't sort of advance that cause. So again, the, the director of the film and anyone producing it has to make choices, and I think this is very instrumental. I finally decided that that particular moment was less important than others. Choices have to be made. You could sit there and say, we'll do a scene and maybe several scenes of, 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 of Shaw agonizing over the decision. And historically, that would be more accurate to have that drawn out, to have that go. And even creatively or dramatically, that might be very powerful because if he's that reluctant, it makes what happens to him ultimately that much more even impactful. Because if he's that reluctant and then goes on to do what he does, uh, that makes that stand out even more. Instead, he has that brief moment of reluctance, so you can sort of say it's true to the historical moment, and yet it's not developed, it's not put out as a, an elongated kind of decision that's slow uh, for uh, Shaw to, to make as a, as a real person in the time frame and the time period in which he existed. So, the director is making choices that are somewhat, again, ahistorical, pulling away maybe from the accurate historical record in that sense, and yet uh, not losing the spirit of it, not losing the essence of it. I mean, it wasn't that he had Shaw jump right on the bandwagon, as it were. Uh, he has that moment of reflection. And then he thinks that that's summed that up enough that we can move forward, because if you spend time there, you're not going to be able to spend time uh, in other ways, in other places. So choices have to be made. Same thing, by the way, later on we'll talk about characters. I think this is fascinating. This is one of those images that's a historical image, and you'll notice that uh, in the movie, I have three figures there that look kind of familiar. I mean, if you kind of look at the hat of the captain here, and you look at the hat in the middle, I mean, it's, again, it's almost as if somebody sat down and said, well, visually, let's see if we can be as true to the record that we have as possible. And these are actual officers from the 54th. Again, you'll notice that the, the nature of those officers is white officers leading black troops. And then again, you can see Shaw, and I put that picture of Shaw uh, with uh, Matthew Broderick standing now over top of him for no particular reason. <laughs> All right, Frederick Douglass, you can see here, I talked about Port Hudson and Milliken's Bend. It's going to be Frederick Douglass who points out those engagements as part of the reason that men of color to arms need to join now, now or never. Make your stand, take your position, and make this your war. Don't make this a war that someone else <coughs> is going to advance your cause for you. You're going to do this for yourself. And you'll notice again, He's going to sign this broadside, the famous men of color to arms. There's President Douglass' signature. Now, in the movie, you'll notice again the depiction of Frederick Douglass is true to Frederick Douglass. He does at some time in his life look like that. And that would be the more popular image of what Frederick Douglass should look like. So that was what audiences would expect. Because audiences would expect it, that's what we're going to give them. That's what the movies do. They don't care if that's an accurate depiction or not. Frederick Douglass is around. Frederick Douglass needs to be there. We know what Frederick Douglass looked like. And ergo, ipso, fatso, there you go. Okay? That's an Italian or something. This is actually what he looked like, actually slightly after that. So he's already a little older there than he was at the time. But it's a very, very different Frederick Douglass. It doesn't defeat the fact that Frederick Douglass is in the film, or a, at least a part of the motivation for uh, moving this cause forward. Uh, again, men of color uh, to, to respond to the war demand uh, so that they can have a stake in this fight themselves. They can be responsible for their own freedom. But it is a different one than the one we're more familiar with that we're perhaps more comfortable with it visually simply because it looks like something we would have seen in a, uh, an American heritage encyclopedia of the Civil War picture. This is an actual broadside for the 54th Massachusetts, and of course, Reedville is where uh, the, um, the, uh, the regiment did its drilling and preparation. 
Uh, you'll note the term contraband of war. If you study the American Civil War, you know that it's Ben Butler who sort of coins that phrase, and then that phrase gets applied very broadly as time goes forward. Butler at the time was trying to make an almost legal argument as uh, slavery was undergoing challenges and a transformation or transition. And uh, he was simply saying that if, if uh, African Americans are property, we don't think that, that they are, but if even the Confederates think they are, you know, what happens when they've been abandoned? What happens when they have been used uh, to further the war effort? So he talks about it almost like salvaging property, salvors, do we have the right of salvors? And he also talks about the notion of, do we have the right to seize property that's used as contraband of war? If you go all the way back to the War of 1812, the notion of having uh, belligerent rights and then neutral rights, one of the things you're not supposed to do is trade in uh, contraband of war, that material that can be used to further the war effort. And if it's seized, then that's just the, the luck of the situation for you. And in the Civil War, this same sort of legalistic argument's being presented early on. Well, we've moved from, we've transitioned from this notion of contraband of war, this sort of legalized definition, to a much more active, much more deliberate role uh, for the African American soldiery in the aftermath of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now you'll notice also, you see the actor John Finn is playing an Irish, uh, Irish sergeant. If you watch the film, you'll note that, uh, if you have seen the film, you'll note that he's very strong in his and his declarations about these individuals and trying to use language that today we would find rather uncomfortable. And even at the, in 1989, you would find it uncomfortable. But, uh, but of course, I guess it fits the drill sergeant uh, mentality. It fits that stereotype pretty well. The, especially the Irish uh, drill sergeant. You'll notice if you ever see a John Ford Western, every one of his sergeants are Irishmen. They usually drink because isn't that what all Irishmen do? They curse, they drink, and they're racist. Well, that's what this fellow is, at least the last part. And, uh, and yet he's partly trying to do these things that he thinks will break down the civilian individual in front of him and help that individual to make that transition to soldier and, uh, and perhaps do those things that will prepare him to have a better chance to survive combat, to survive war. So again, the colonel will intervene. If you've seen the movie, you notice the colonel oversees some of this behavior, especially towards his friend Thomas Searles. And uh, by the way, you know, getting back to the 54th Thomas is far more normal for that unit than anybody else in that unit. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but here is uh, that moment where the colonel is trying to say you have to learn to shoot, you have to learn to shoot properly, you have to learn to prepare yourself or it could cost you your life. And so uh, he's uh, standing over his charge, in this case, to try to get him to, uh, to become a man, but also to become a soldier. Okay, assessment from one Confederate. I thought at least I ought to mention that the Confederacy does toy with the idea of whether African American slaves should be made into soldiers. <laughs> Uh, as late as January 1865, Howell Cobb of Georgia is going to talk about the notion of, of African Americans as soldiers as challenging the very fundamental nature of the Confederate States of America. But he's actually saying that in a couple of different ways. Number one, of course, the, the whole notion of slavery and the importance of slavery and, and the role, as he sees it, of racial order. But also, he knows that if you start bringing in uh, African Americans as soldiers, some of the white soldiers of the Confederacy has to depend upon might decide that they're not going to support the Confederacy any longer. It is a complex story. It, every bit of this history is complex. And uh, what he's going to suggest, of course, is that slaves can't make good soldiers, but if they do, then everything we think about slavery is wrong. Interestingly enough, if you think that slaves are capable of learning and obeying orders, and so forth, then why couldn't they be soldiers? Because isn't that what you think soldiers should do? <laughs> so it's kind of funny how, you know, how he's trying to ride the wave of what's happening in the world around him and make sense of a world that uh, no longer fits the parameters that he is as comfortable with. And I just wanted to point out that uh, as early as a year prior to this, uh, there was at least one very prominent Confederate who had suggested that if 
the Confederacy wants to win, it needs manpower. And if it's going to get manpower, it needs to start arming slaves. And that idea was shelved and put into the drawer, literally put in the drawer in Richmond until about a year later. It will be in the spring of 65 when the Congress, when Robert E. Lee, when a lot of things on the Confederate side are finally seeing what has been happening on the Union side and decides to move in that direction, but of course it's much too late. And, uh, and it, the time Richmond Falls is apparently a very small company of African American slaves who are being trained on the grounds but certainly nothing to, to, uh, to brag about or nothing to think will save the day for the Confederacy because it's much too little and much too late. All right, put other figures here because I didn't know what else to call this because these are just some unusual pieces of the story of glory, including the mother of, of Robert Gould Shaw, Sarah Blake Sturgis Shaw, and played in this case by Jane Alexander, a very fine actress who's uh, probably... Uh, very comfortable in this role. Uh, again, Mrs. Shaw was very, very outspoken, very, uh, for her time, very abolitionist, and yet in the movie, uh, very, very much in the background, very much uh, just a small piece of sort of the, the fabric that you see and you don't see much of her. But again, she was probably as instrumental as anybody in pushing Robert toward the 54th and again promoting the agenda of abolitionism. Uh, in the movie, uh, this fellow becomes sort of a negative guy. That's one of the great actors, uh, a character actress named Bob Gunton. Bob Gunton plays uh, Charles Harker. Charlie Harker was not a general at the time, but he will become a general. Uh, he's much younger than the actor that played him, and the actor that played him played him in a very, very different light than historically he deserved. Uh, Charles Harker was not engaged in the kind of plundering. If you've ever seen the movie, you remember there's a scene where they're in the parlor, there's all the candelabra and all the other things that they confiscated from all these plantations. And uh, James Montgomery is there with him. Cliff D. Young is playing the piano or the harpsichord or whatever that is. And they're playing and, and smoking cigars and having a good old time when uh, Colonel Shaw comes in to say, we want to have our... Uh, soldiers fight, and, uh, and you're in the way, and basically uh, they're in the way because they don't want anything to rock their boat. Uh, Parker did not have that reputation. In reality, he was a no-nonsense soldier. He will actually be killed in the fighting that takes place if you come to Kennesaw. I will take you to Cheatham Hill at Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, and you can see where Charlie Parker gave his life for his cause. Uh, not at all the way he's depicted in the film, but you got to have a foil. And there's actually a couple of foils. The quartermaster is another foil, the one who's denying the troops their shoes. So if you've ever seen the movie, you'll see a couple of folks that have to play a bad guy role. Because again, somebody's got to be somebody that you have to deal with, you have cha presents challenges, and who are those bad guys? You'll notice that you don't have speaking roles for Confederates. So those Confederates are not going to do the talking so that you can have them be the bad guys. You're going to have figures like uh, Colonel Harker, later Brigadier General Harker, and, um, and, and the Quartermaster. Uh, I think his name was Richard Reel, R-I-E-H-L-E, -E, that played the Quartermaster. He's a good character. That's J.O. Sanders. He plays General George Crockett Strong, and uh, he does a fine job sort of giving that send-off speech. That again, the timing may be a little off, but uh, the speech is, uh, is, is meant to be inspirational. And if you'll remember, there was a sort of a scene, if, some, if this person should fall, who will pick up the flag? Do you remember who came up to pick up the, said he'd pick up the flag? Remember who it was? Thomas. It's Thomas. Hmm. Not in real life. Hmm. You know who it was in real life? Shaw. Colonel Robert Shaw was the one who said, I will and step forward. Now, that doesn't mean that the spirit of Thomas isn't alive and well, because everybody behind Shaw is a Thomas. Okay? And just understand, that's, that's the usual character, somebody that's from a very different background than the coastal part of Carolina. If you looked at James Montgomery's troops, they came from plantations that had run away from slavery. These men from the 54th Massachusetts are from a very different set of, of circumstances. And it's much more likely that Thomas Searles would be the person that's reflective of that than anybody else in the unit. 
Okay, here's a picture of James Montgomery in the movie, played by Cliff D. Young. Here he is at Darien, Georgia, where the 54th is required to participate in the burning of the town and so forth. And of course, I picked a picture that I thought was unsavory. Look at that hairdo. Uh, look at that hairdo. I guess that's why he wears a hat. Uh, but anyway, uh, he was a sort of a zealot. Uh, he was an, almost a religious zealot. Uh, he talks about sweeping away these people as, as he would the Jews of old. So he's got his own sort of issues and baggage. But he's, and he's leading troops. And again, he considers undis undisciplined. And, and in fact, if you've seen this image, uh, you'll remember that there was a scene where the uh, woman is being accosted by one of the soldiers. And he shoots one of his own men in cold blood, shoots him down. Of course, Shaw is horrified by this. And interestingly enough, that relationship was a little more complex than that. If you read Shaw's letters, one of my uh, old colleagues from years and years ago, in fact, was in graduate school with me at uh, Georgia, University of Georgia, uh, named uh, Russell Duncan, has written uh, a very fine uh, compendium, if you will, of, of Robert Gould Shaw's uh, letters. And if you read the letters, you'll see that he's kind of complimentary of, of Montgomery until after this raid when he's a little bit more critical. But at least up to it, he's actually Shaw is kind of complimentary. Okay, here's a picture of the defenses. And uh, it's just a general thing to get you oriented. Here's Fort Sumter. Here's Battery Wagner. Here's the long stretch of, of, of uh, island, uh, coastal, uh, sort of from beachfront property. God knows what it would be worth if it wasn't underwater today. Uh, a lot of swamp, which is going to funnel the troops you'll see in just one second. Here's James Island, if you remember the sort of the, the moment that the 54th gets its earliest uh, combat experience is on James Island. This whole region is sort of more or less called James Island. Some of that fighting was actually a lot further down in this area than where you see the name James Island here. And so the movement is sort of toward uh, Ch Charleston. I don't want you to get confused because, of course, in the movie, they're actually coming from Charleston to attack the fort. And again, you've got to put the set where the set will go. You've got to make it work. And so one of the complaints might be that they're attacking the wrong way. But in spirit, they're certainly reflecting an attack that took place and the circumstances that you will see uh, took place. So we'll talk about that. Here's an uh, image again of that movie, of that first confrontation with Confederates at Grimble's Landing. In the movie, it says James Island. It's the same kind of place. All of this is James Island. And this shows a, a marker that's been, uh, or a map that's been marked up to show where some of that attacking is, is taking place. So again, the 54th has its trial by combat. And uh, if you remember the movie, they repulse the Confederates. And, uh, and get bloodied at the same time, or bloodied at the same time themselves. Uh, here are some of the images, and uh, a more modern one there, but some of the images from the period or just after it that, uh, that uh, depict what the fighting might have looked like. Keep in mind that you don't have uh, people standing there taking images as the fighting takes place. And some of this is very glamorized, and some of it, of course, does depict uh, the troops engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat here it shows Shaw sort of coming into some of what looks like maybe uh, picket lines or something as opposed to the, fort, the main fort itself. So again, the images are not overwhelmingly helpful when you try to look at them and really get a sense of what the fort looked like at the time. Uh, later on, it's not going to be much better. But we do know that if the 54th is going to attack, it only has a narrow corridor to attack, and it isn't the only regiment that will attack. Uh, just behind it are going to be uh, Connecticut troops, and then troops from uh, kind of pretty much all over. They're going to be troops from uh, New York, Ohio, all kinds of troops kind of stacked up in what is known as a column of wings. The column of wings was a way of trying to keep these troops together as they surge forward. The men at the front would, of course, have fixed bayonets and present this sort of steel bristling kind of thing coming forward toward Fort Wagner and, uh, or Battery Wagner, you can call it either one. And the 54th, of course, are the troops that are going to do that. They had uh, 264 men, I believe, that were part of this, um, of this part of the attack. I should say uh, the 
five companies are going to be at the front, five companies immediately behind, and then those other troops stacked up behind them. So a couple of, uh, again, just the images to show you sort of what the, um, the circumstances were. You see the swamp itself being pretty much responsible for funneling them with the, uh, the beachfront kind of also serving as a, as a funnel. Uh, the Confederates had already repulsed an attack by the Federals earlier. Uh, that attack had not been supported by artillery. Uh, this attack is heavily supported by artillery. Uh, the gunboats as well as other artillery is going to be brought to bear all day long. The attack actually doesn't come until almost the end of the day, about 7.45. Uh, Shaw will uh, raise his sword and set the men off to attack. So the notion, again, of attacking meant not necessarily attacking in the broadest of daylight, but to give yourself perhaps a little bit more cover as you could approach the fort in the gathering darkness uh, after it had been, quote, quote softened up by the, uh, by the artillery. Okay, in the aftermath, a couple of things I think are very interesting. Uh, again, the movie is going to do certain things. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, here is Morgan Freeman uh, as the sergeant in, uh, at the, the, in the movie. Uh, historically, one of the figures that's probably one of the heroes of, of any battle, much less this battle, but the heroes of uh, a battle that uh, is going to cost him uh, severely in, in being hit uh, repeatedly. Ultimately, if you talk about who will pick this flag up, this is the man that picks the flag up. Uh, William Carney is going to end up winning the Medal of Honor uh, for bringing the flag back uh, in the aftermath of the fighting as he drags himself and the flag back. Uh, it might have been interesting to, again, put uh, Frederick Douglass's children or sons into this picture more prominently. Uh, I don't know. Uh, again, I haven't looked at correspondence in which they talked talk about whether they made a decision to do this or not to do this and why they did that. But Lewis Douglas would have certainly been a, a, a figure that you might have expected, and maybe you do see, because maybe he's sort of a composite. We'll talk about composite figures. Morgan Freeman's kind of composite, maybe, of these two individuals. But I think this is a powerful letter that, uh, that Lewis Douglas writes in the aftermath of this fighting. It talks about being in two fights and I'm unhurt. I'm about to go into another, I believe, tonight. Our men fought well on both occasions. The last was a desperate charge in which we made a, a, an assault against that terrible battery on Morris Island known as Fort Wagner or Battery Wagner. We were repulsed with the loss of three killed and wounded. He's talking about in, in his immediate uh, comrades. I escaped unhurt from amidst the uh, from the midst of that shooting of what amounted to a perfect hail of shot and shell that was terrible. This is what the toll of war will ultimately be for the 54th. Uh, and again, uh, when you have uh, so many men sent into combat, I said 200. That was actually how many were killed, wounded, and captured. 264 was the total uh, out of 624, 624 that went into the fight. And so, you know, about a third of those men are struck down in that fight. And the movie makes it seem more uh, total in the numbers, but uh, they're going to be pretty substantial. Uh, this, the 54th loses about 54 men, I think it loses 54 men killed. The, uh, one of the other uh, regiments that went in with it lost 77 killed. So it's not even the the regiment that loses the most men, but you can't take away the sacrifice of the individuals who lead the charge and are making their best effort with their comrades coming in behind to support them. And the bullets didn't care, black or white. The bullets didn't care who you were, brave or cowardly or anything else. And we'll never know how many of those individuals um, responded under the duress of combat in the way that human beings would respond, which is bound to be in every way you can imagine. Um, somebody once wrote about Fredericksburg, when, when shells start cracking heads like eggshells, men seek the lowest place they can go. And so again, it doesn't have to be uh, troops that are uh, one type of troop or another, one background or another, one heritage or another. You put any human beings into these circumstances and you can probably imagine. But the film has to focus on, you know, something that, again, the viewer either A, expects or the message they want that viewer to take away. 
Uh, here are the images that uh, Josie mentioned, some of them from uh, Charleston, South Carolina, after the fighting. And you'll notice the, uh, a version of the Confederate flag flying over the, the, um, the uh, fortifications that still ring the city. Uh, on September, I think it was 6th, 1863, the Confederates will abandon uh, uh, Battery Wagner, Fort Wagner, and they will abandon, um, they will abandon Morris Island. So it's at that point where things get even more constricted, but it's not until the end of the war that Charleston finally falls and look who gets to walk in, the 54th Massachusetts. 54th Massachusetts, having gone through all of the things they went through after that battle uh, of Fort Wagner that's uh, highlighted in glory. Uh, down in Florida, the Battle of Alesti and so forth, the, the unit went on to fight and to win laurels and glory, additional laurels and additional glory for itself and its surviving members. Memorials, there are a number of ways in which the 54th and its sacrifice has been remembered. Uh, probably the most famous is the, is the uh, memorial in Boston, the Boston Commons, the St. Godin's Memorial. Of course, Kurz and Allison put out a whole series of, of these images that are very highly sanitized. You really kind of see everybody nicely dressed and bright uniforms and beautiful outfits and the forts look more like something you might have seen out of World War One than you see in the Civil War. Uh, they do at least show the, the support from the gunboats and the, and the, uh, and the uh, waters off of, of Morris Island, but there's one small problem with that. If they're firing now, what are they doing? Hitting their own they're men. hitting their own men. So it makes a nice image, mm -hmm. but you put that image in reality and you would be killing your own people with your own shells. Here's a sad fact. Some of these men, as the units came up behind them, really did continue to fire. Some of them were supposed to go in with the bayonet and they weren't supposed to have their weapons capped and armed and ready to fire. But some of them went in firing anyway and were, were hitting their own men. They were hitting their own men. So the tragedy was double fold. Uh, but you can see that this comes out in the 1890s, a series that looks very similar uh, for a lot of different battles, uh, for battles across the, the Civil War spectrum. The recorder of Deeds building has this image of the 54th, has of course Colonel Shaw struck down. It's a little bit more of a uh, sort of, I call it the uh, New Deal image that comes out of that kind of artistry that you'll see promoted and produced. And again, very different in its imagery than the images of, of, of Kurz and Allison. Let's finish up with movie memory. Here, of course, is the great scene of the men gathering, getting ready to fight. I think probably one of my most memorable scenes is uh, when Morgan Freeman tells the drummer boys to go back, and the one in particular says, I'll be back directly, we'll be back directly. And, uh, you know, just very emotional scenes throughout the scene where they first arrive in the South and they say the year of Jubilee has arrived and so forth. All of these things are just very powerful. And here you see the, the prominent actors that are going to be the, the sort of key figures that we follow the story of and the fate of the 54th and the attack that's being made. Composite figures, here's of course Tripp played by Denzel Washington that's going to do, uh, do well for him as an actor we'll see in just a few minutes. Of course, there's Morgan Freeman with Tripp behind him and, and Thomas over here on his side. Uh, the um, images are, again, composite. There is not one single individual that these folks are representing, but they're representing people who reflect some of the issues that, again, would bring these people together. The issues of slavery and escaping from slavery with, again, the images of the back torn by um, the lash of the master. Uh, now the lash of a new master, which is part of what Tripp continues to rebel against. Uh, I'm not going to carry a flag. I'm not going to do this. And of course, in the end, who picks up the flag? You say, you know what I'm saying. Well, if you didn't see the movie, I didn't give anything away. Just pretend you didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Cabot Forbes uh, that uh, is the friend of Thomas, uh, excuse me, of Robert Gould's uncle Thomas, too, for that matter. Uh, we don't know who he really was meant to be. But probably the closest is the uh, second in command of the 54th, who actually gets badly wounded, is knocked out of action even before uh, Shaw is killed, and comes back later to, to command the 54th, Edward Ned Needles Hallowell. Uh, so probably, again, similar 
facial issues and, and Kepi and so forth. Maybe that's what was designed and meant. Setting the stage, of course, all films are staged. There are going to be all kinds of ways in which you try to enhance the imagery for the audience. Uh, I always love this because it's one of those scenes where these men are marching through and one of the men standing there watching the march through has been the same man who has attacked them on racial grounds earlier and now it says give them hell 54. And it's just a very uplifting thing. It gives you chills to even think about it. Uh, but I think funny, here's artillery pieces. If you watch the movie, they do not fire when they don't need to fire. They fire when you want them to fire and then they stop firing. So they don't interfere with the music or the image or anything else. And then they fire again. I don't know in combat whether they would be that <laughs> meticulous about determining when they fired and when they didn't fire uh, to, not avoid, to avoid messing up the scene. But you can understand what they're doing. Of course, the final fate, it's hard to see that image with these lights, but uh, there's Colonel Shaw. And you'll notice again, Tripp is going to slowly, gently come down on his shoulder, the two of them now sharing a common grave. The survivors coming in to face the last elements of the defenses before they too are supposedly blasted. Uh, again, if this is, say, Lewis Douglas or if that's, you know, Ned Hollowell, it doesn't, they would have survived. So they didn't get blasted away. And you don't necessarily see that, you just see the cannon firing and the smoke and the next thing you see is the, is the aftermath, you see the, um, the uh, burial of the individuals that have fallen. That, that helps a little bit. Thank you so much, David. So anyway, there's the iconic picture. Of course, the comment that um, is made that uh, he's buried with his men. He's buried with his men, whether he's fallen. Budget for the film is about 18 million. I don't know the year that this final figure was dra drafted, uh, but uh, certainly in, in the period in which they were sort of determining the marketability of the film, uh, it was it was an expensive film in a lot of ways, $18 million, but it grossed uh, far and above what it cost, which of course meant that it was considered to be successful commercially. We know it was successful to the audiences. Audiences loved it. There have been a lot of ways in which the films inspired um, other kinds of, uh, of efforts, including uh, reenactments for African Americans. I understand we have a potential. Can you reenact somebody here and reenact? So I don't know what inspired you to do it, but it probably didn't hurt to have glory give that, give that uh, sort of impetus. Um, I know that uh, people that would have probably not engaged in this sort of thing, even to know that they could engage in this sort of thing, have done it because glory inspired them. Glory gave them an opportunity to, to see and understand and experience and now present that, that piece of history, which is wonderful. Again, my favorite guy, you can see Morgan Freeman there in the front, uh, and, uh, and we'll talk about him some more here in just a second. It's possible that this will go fast, so just in case it doesn't, that's what Denzel Washington got out of the film. Not only did, of course, he do a, a sterling performance, uh, but he also got an Academy Award, and he got one of three that uh, Glory will get for Best Actor in a Supporting Role, uh, Best cin Cinematography, and Best Sound. Uh, that same year, another film came out. In some ways, maybe it should have had its prime character win an Academy Award, but in some ways it also did not reflect what a 1989 audience was kind of looking for in, in a portrayal of an African American, and that portrayal was historically as accurate as one could get with, again, as fine an actor as one can get. Anybody guess where I'm going? driving this case. And you think about it, who is the actor that's in both of those films? Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. And you can say that Morgan Freeman was portraying, you know, a subservient African American figure, but that's what that figure was supposed to be in the time frame that he was living and working in. And, and this man who was a grave digger turned sergeant, and this man who was a chauffeur turned best friend, I mean, this guy captured them both. This guy, if he, that was the actor of the year to me. So, and he's still, still, if we put Morgan Freeman in it, I will go. I will go. <laughs> okay, let me finish here. I know we have this in the bookstore that you can get a copy of. That's one of more Kunstler's images. Uh, notice the, uh, the famed St. Gaudens uh, Commons kind of uh, image there with veterans walking past it paying homage. And, uh, and again, 
The story of the 54th is a story of the American Civil War, the story of sacrifice, the story of individuals who answered their country's call. And in this case, wanted to have a stake and willing to make the sacrifice ex expected uh, to, to stand for freedom, to stand for their own freedom and the freedom of those they would never meet or never know. So I think War is one of the great films. It's one of the uh, classics. It's an iconic film in many ways. Um, I think it will stand the test of time. It'll be one of those films that you can watch many years hence and won't say, well, boy, that is kind of anachronistic or odd or out of whack. Uh, it's a good film. Yes, it has those historical little anomalous type things, but for the most part, I think it holds up. Um, some people even criticize it being sort of typical of the buddy film in war, where you have a number of individuals that sort of come from different backgrounds and come together to, to uh, support and, and protect and, and, and guard and take care of each other. Uh, it has a lot of the iconic moments that you would want a film like this to have. I think probably, again, there's so many favorites that come along, but one of the favorites is the scene where the men are contemplating what will happen the next day and doing it in song and doing it in story and doing it in a way that, uh, that is meaningful to them but then meaningful to the audience. I mean, if the audience doesn't get uh, worked up from that, uh, they're dead. They're not there. Uh, and, and in many ways, again, that film just does that. There's so many moments where you just, you just get captured and captivated and isn't that what a good motion picture ought to do? Thank you again for having me over tonight.